Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome back to the channel, friends old and new from near and far. Good to have you with us today. Today we're going to work on this uh, 1962 Omega Constellation. We see it's uh, running. And we also see that uh, the date changes at midnight. And we can semi-quick set the date by turning the hands back to around 9 and then cross midnight again. So that tells us this has got to be a 561 movement. Because the 564 would have a quick set where you pull the crown out to advance the date. We see the watch also has the original bracelet. And the dial looks in a very fine condition. So that's good to see. Let's put it on the time grapher and see how it runs before we do anything else. And that looks pretty good. Slightly low amplitude and a little bit uh, too high uh, rate. The beat error is not too bad. And the lines are nice and straight. So this looks good. All it needs a service. By the way, these uh, sticky balls are great for unscrewing case backs. Of course, Persian now makes one for 200 uh, francs, or approximately. And the movement looks to be in great condition. Nice and clean. Wouldn't expect anything else, uh, given that the time grapher is uh, so good already. Now, I think I said before that it's good practice to take the rotor off while the movement is in the case. Somehow I chose not to do that here. But it is uh, preferable, I would say, even though it's not a big deal. We're going to set the hands so that we can uh, take them off uh, nicely and easily with uh, the hand levers. For the hand levers, it's also better that they are basically as wide as possible for the reason that uh, that means less pressure per square millimeter on the dial so there's less chance of damaging the dial I'm gonna put the dial and hands and later also the date disc away in these uh, dial cases Now we're going to first take uh, the rotor off. And then we'll take the automatic assembly off. When taking any automatic assembly or module off, it's a good idea to uh, give a little bit uh, pressure on the crown, a little wind if you will. It takes the pressure off the wheels that connect the automatic module to the winding works. And with the automatic module off we can also then let down the mainspring. To further make sure that there's no power left, I'm going to take the ratchet wheel off. And on the 550 series movements, uh, the ratchet wheel is actually uh, two pieces, upper and lower, where the upper has this uh, internal uh, star wheel and rotates the internally cut teeth on the lower ratchet wheel. It's supposed to be more efficient for winding, but uh, well, most of the movements don't have it. I'm 
Then we can take the pallet fork bridge and the pallet fork out. And this is really why it's important to take uh, the wind off the mainspring. If it's uh, fully wound and you try to take the pallet fork out, you can break the pivots. We're going to check the end shake and the side shake as we normally do. Even though we're quite convinced that uh, this uh, watch is in good condition, still important to check. So while we disassemble the gear train, we can uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Constellation as a model. It was introduced all the way back in 1952. So that's uh, nearing on 70 years. That's one of the longest uh, continuous production lines of watches ever. Of course Omega also has the Seamaster, which was started even earlier, back in uh, 1948. But the Constellation was uh, really designed to be something special. It was to be a chronometer rated uh, family of automatic watches. And the design of the watch was also made to sort of celebrate Omega's uh, history in observatory tests or chronometer tests. And that's why the case back medallion has those uh, eight stars, as well as the engraving of the uh, Geneva Observatory. The eight stars are to commemorate the uh, world records that Omega set back in 1931 and 33, basically sweeping all the records in uh, Neuchâtel and Kew. And the medallion itself was also the first for uh, Omega on a wristwatch. Of course, it was pretty common to have decorations like that on uh, pocket watches. And for Omega, it was also a great way to emphasize their uh, very good history in chronometer testing. Omega was the biggest watchmaker, most uh, prestigious at the time. So uh, that fit in well. And the medallions were uh, very popular also. So they started also using them on uh, the Seamaster, the Deville, and so forth. And of course, uh, Longines is also quite famous for their nice uh, medallions. Same as uh, Seiko with their uh, Grand Seiko and King Seikos. But the Constellation really popularized that whole concept in wristwatches. So we've gotten all the way down to the Keyless Works. We've uh, talked about the 550 family uh, before. It is uh, generally regarded as one of the most successful and best uh, family of movements ever made by any manufacturer. And when we talk about the 550 family, it's actually a pretty big family. With 12 automatic movements and uh, 6 uh, manual wind ones. And all in all, I believe they produced about 10 million movements in the whole family. But there might be some experts uh, watching this who can uh, comment on uh, the exact numbers. That would be great. But especially the chronometer rated uh, members of the family. And perhaps most of all the 564 has a reputation for being perhaps the best movement ever made. But I think that also has to be uh, viewed a little bit in light of the time it was made. But certainly a very, very high performing movement. As is the 561, of course, that we're working on here. And the 551, the predecessor without a date. And also the 751, the chronometer rated the day date version. And as we're saying that, we're pinging the barrel arbor slightly. Now we can take the mainspring out and have a look at it. It's probably good. Yeah, that looks just fine. So the barrel and the barrel lid also look fine. Just gonna peg out uh, the old uh, grease and get it ready for the cleaning machine. Uh, 
and we're also going to disassemble the automatic module. One thing I mentioned before when it comes to screws in a movement like this, you will see that some of the screws have uh, polished ends. It's not the head, but the uh, end of the screw. And of course, the reason they're polished is that they will uh, show somewhere. Unless it's a uh, Vacheron, Patek, or Audemars, or that kind of thing, where everything is polished regardless, but that's not the case here. So that means that the polished ends will go through the automatic module and actually show from the top of the movement. All right, then we can get everything cleaned. Got all the parts back from my cleaning. First thing we need to do is uh, put uh, the main spring back into the barrel. So we're going to put some uh, braking grease along the walls of the barrel. There are a lot of different kinds of braking greases. I use uh, one called the Klüber or thereabouts. And for all the fellow tinkerers, if you're doing uh, quite a bit of uh, this kind of work, then uh, these uh, mainspring winders are really invaluable. You get different kinds. This is the most common one. I think nowadays you also get uh, cheaper Chinese uh, variations which aren't always worth the savings. It's often better to buy uh, once of good quality than several times of bad quality. But you can also find the good quality Chinese ones, by all means. All right, with the main spring in the barrel, we're gonna grease it a little bit. I'm gonna oil the barrel arbor a little bit and put the lid back on. Then we're going to turn to the jewels. This is, uh, of course, Inca block, which is uh, a lot easier to work on than uh, some other models. You might remember the uh, anti shock uh, ones that we uh, worked on for uh, the Elgin. But Inca block is uh, very easy to uh, oil and uh, put the shaft on back. And we like easy. Speaking of easy, the 550 series is uh, generally very straightforward. There's uh, not really any hidden things that will uh, allow you to break uh, pivots, for instance as you quite easily can with the third wheels on IWC calibers from the same time period, for instance. These movements were also very solidly made. It's just uh, really built to last. It's part of the uh, Swiss culture to build things that will last a hundred years. And that is certainly the case with a movement like this. And with the shock settings back and oiled, you see that the balance uh, oscillates very nicely and freely. So 
then we can take it off again and place it safely in the tray. It is, by the way, uh, exactly three months since we uploaded the first video on this channel. And uh, we just passed 1000 subscribers. So thanks to everyone who contributed to this. Very much appreciated. Shows there is an interest for uh, shaky hands and really bad uh, dad jokes. And wife jokes, I have to admit. My wife doesn't really know that she's uh, featured heavily in these videos. And I would appreciate it if we could uh, keep it that way. So let this be between you and me. Because hell hath no fury like a wife scorned. Or rather a wife feeling scorned for some uh, less than obvious reason to our simple uh, male brains. Coincidentally, I was looking at uh, the uh, statistics for the channel. And as expected, uh, almost all viewers are male. And I think that's reflective of the whole watchmaking industry, that there are just very few women and I think it would be uh, certainly beneficial to have more women in uh, watchmaking. But it might also be that the whole concept of picking things apart and putting them back together is more appealing to, uh, to men. Hoping uh, that doesn't sound too misogynist. Anyway, we've gotten the wheel train assembled. You can see it runs uh, freely. So putting a little bit of uh, HP 1300 or D5 under this uh, brass ring that uh, goes under the crown wheel. And the same, a tiny little drop on the inside of uh, the wheel where this uh, middle piece uh, fits in. And then we can put on this uh, double layered ratchet wheel. So we lavished quite some praise on the 550 family overall, without really discussing why it is such a successful uh, movement and uh, why it is so good. It comes down to a lot of the same factors as uh, we discussed for the Calibre 89 for my WC. It's about uh, reliability. It's about uh, being well built and solid and also easy to repair and maintain. And technically it was also a big improvement of course over the previous uh, generations. The 354 movement was a bumper automatic. Whereas the 550 series is of course a full rotor automatic, bi-directional winding. It has a swan neck uh, regulator. You have a monometallic and glucidure balance wheel. And the whole thing was that uh, Omega could really mass produce this series of movement to a degree that was yet not known in uh, watch manufacturing. So it was uh, for that reason also a success. Success is often measured in numbers. In terms of uh, production quantity, there's nothing in this time period that compares. Add to that that uh, it's a pretty attractive movement in uh, terms of the design. Of course, it's not like it uh, is finished anyway near the same as uh, Vachol Constata. And also less uh, finished than RWC or Jaeger Le Coulter for that sake. But it's still an attractive movement. 
Of course, this uh, copper plating that Omega used back in the day is a uh, very nice color. And in terms of weaknesses, there really aren't many. It's a very well designed workhorse movement. But if I were to point out something, I would say that uh, the same problem with the reversal wheel, as we discussed in uh, previous videos. And also uh, the second pinion, the friction spring. It's relatively common to see uh, these uh, movements, the 550 uh, series, with the stuttering seconds hand. That's of course easy to rectify, so maybe that's not really a weak point with the movement, but more with the uh, people servicing it. But perhaps the biggest weakness is not in the movement but in that it might have created a little bit of an uh, infallible culture within the Omega. Because of course the actual successor to the 550 series was the 1000 series. And the 1000 series was uh, less than uh, enthusiastically received, to put it that way. So that massive fall from grace also led to a fall from the throne in terms of uh, watchmaking uh, prestige and uh, numbers. All right, we're actually getting quite close to uh, assembling the watch. putting on this uh, cover plate that's also the setting lever spring we want to screw it down a little bit first and then get uh, that spring in place behind that little nub on the setting lever before we screw it down fully that's something we typically do with everything that's a spring we'll have lots of that types of springs in the uh, chronograph for instance we're going to do an uh, Omega Chrono Stop very soon, so now we'll uh, see some of that. We fix or dropped the pallet fork, as we always do. And we can get the uh, pallet uh, bridge back in place. Now, normally we would uh, time the watch at this point. But we already know that the watch is actually keeping good time. So we're just going to replace uh, everything in the uh, automatic module at the same time and then put it back on before we time the watch. As I said before, there's a lot of uh, ways to skin a cat. And again, I don't know why people would want to skin a cat in the first place. I mean, granted, cats are kind of useless around the house. My personal theory is that if a Nigerian prince was reborn, it would be as a cat. Because cats really have the perfect scam going. They get food and shelter and basically anything they want. And all they do in return is uh, purr once in a while and maybe come when you call for them. Most likely not. And if they do come, they sort of uh, put their uh, anus right into your face. So actually, come to think of it, I do think I understand why people would skin a cat. Anyway, we've pretty much gotten the automatic module back together as well. We're going to oil it, both on the underside and on the top side. And then we're going to see if we can make this watch run as a chronometer should run. So while we quite literally build up to that moment, let's uh, talk a little bit about what a chronometer is. The term chronometer was first used by the man who first measured the speed of sound 
a clergyman and scientist called William Durham. And as you might remember from previous discussions in these videos, uh, most of these inventions were made in England, so also this one. But uh, the term was really made famous by John Harrison when he solved the longitude problem with his uh, marine chronometers. And in short, the longitude problem was uh, that it was very difficult to accurately measure how far you traveled west or east uh, on the ocean with a ship. North and south was not very difficult because you could always look at the angle of the sun. But east and west was very difficult. And there were quite a few uh, accidents where ships uh, didn't know where they were and all of a sudden sailed into uh, big rocks and that kind of thing. And long story short, John Harrison was the first to solve that problem back in 1761 with a watch that was uh, a little bit uh, more like an alarm clock nowadays, being about 13 centimeters wide. But the term chronometer nowadays is uh, well defined. It's a series of tests that a movement has to go through in order to be certified as a chronometer, typically by Kosk in Switzerland. Let's uh, illustrate how these tests are run. So the movements are tested in five different positions, one of them being a dial up, as we see here. Then you have dial down, and then you have a nine up, three up, and six up. The movements are tested like that for 15 days, not the whole 24 hours per day, but uh, over a 15 day period. And the temperature is also varied. Mostly it stays at 23 degrees, so sort of room temperature. But it's also down to 8 degrees and up to 38 degrees. And then they calculate uh, the uh, deviations in different positions with the temperature and so forth. Perhaps the best known uh, deviation is uh, the average uh, daily rate should be between minus four and plus six seconds per day. So as we can see in this uh, little simulation, this watch uh, actually stays nicely within those limits. There are a couple of conclusions that can be drawn from that. One is that the watches Omega made back then are still very, very high quality. And the second is that the COSC test isn't necessarily that strict. In fact, with uh, today's uh, standards of uh, production, basically any movement should be able to do a COSC certification. It doesn't cost the manufacturers more than uh, 4 or $5 to actually get a certification. But of course they have to time and adjust the uh, movements a little bit extra, so that's where the actual costs are. But of course they're also going to charge more for a watch with uh, officially certified chronometer on the dial. Another thing that's also worth noting with the current uh, COSC certification is that there's no measurement of things like uh, impact of shock or a magnetism, which is quite prevalent in our modern society, uh, or things like uh, humidity and lower temperatures and uh, plus eight are also not tested. And finally, the COSC tests are only done with the movement. So they don't actually test the watch itself. And all of these things uh, combined lead up to uh, that uh, companies like uh, Rolex and Omega actually have their own standards which are more stringent. So when you see a Rolex with a superlative chronometer on the dial, it means that the assembled watch runs to uh, between minus two and plus two seconds per day. So better than COSC, and also with the cased movement and not just the movement itself. All right, we've got the date disc back on. Let's just see that it flips over the way it should. And then we'll test the quick set or semi quick set. Okay, we're going to put a little bit of HP 1300 or D5 on uh, the jumper, just so it uh, slides smoothly and decisively over the teeth.
And we're going to do that for every single tooth on the date disk. Not showing all of them. Now we see this dial is in very nice condition. Probably the most famous constellation is the, the Pi Pan version. But this uh, reference with this uh, brushed, very shiny dial also looks great. And we know that when the date flips over, it should be midnight. So then we can put the hour hand on then. And we're always testing that the hands uh, run parallel to the dial. That they don't uh, hook up or snag on anything including the other hands, of course, when we put the minute and seconds hands on. So some final words on this whole uh, chronometer uh, discussion. Is there any point in it? Well, probably not. It's honestly more of a marketing thing and a way of uh, charging higher prices for a watch. Because uh, today's watches will keep close to cost standards regardless. And even then, most people nowadays don't really buy watches to keep accurate time. It is really more of a fashion thing or a luxury thing. Plus, of course, quartz is still much more accurate than the mechanical watches anyway. But quartz just isn't fascinating. Think of it this way. How much is 17 times 13? Five, four, three, two, one. Time's up. Now, anyone able to calculate that in their heads within five seconds can be pretty proud of themselves. And if someone does it in, let's say, three seconds, people will be like, wow, you're really good at math. But if it took three or five seconds for a calculator to come up with the answer, You'd probably be shaking it and thinking, my god, the batteries must be dead. So mechanical watches keeping time that accurate, that's like, wow. It really is possible, just with metal. That is much more impressive than it is for a little computer to do the same. And I think that to most people is really why we like mechanical watches. Plus, of course, for us tinkerers, we can pull apart wheels and cogs and springs and uh, levers. But we cannot really do anything with circuit boards. Alright, we polished the crystal a little bit. There were a couple of scratches there, so we used Polywatch and uh, soft cloth. And then we can case the movement again. Sorry for this being a little bit out of focus. And my colleague still isn't finished with that Casio. Just throw it away already, man. Seriously. What's the new price? Like $7? I don't know, man. Anyway, I'm going to put some uh, HP 1300 or D5 on the rotor post. Then we can put the rotor back on, put in the locking piece, and then we're pretty much done. We just need to uh, put uh, new gaskets on the case back, and put the bracelet back on, and then uh, that's it. 
pretty straightforward service this time. By the way, what we're doing here is to see if the rotor stays at the bottom of the watch when we rotate the watch. That's a rule of thumb test to see that the rotor rotates freely. It will rotate more freely the less wound the watch is, of course. And we're putting back the case screws. These are a little bit tight, these clamps, but uh, that's how it should be. With this particular watch, I didn't mention that, but uh, some of you have probably seen it. There's a little crack in the bezel at around 10.30 here. We could try to laser weld that, but uh, that will have to be some other time. I think the watch looks very nice on the wrist. Beautiful dial, fully original. And with that, I want to say uh, thank you for watching. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us here. If you enjoyed the video, I uh, would be very happy if you uh, click uh, like and uh, subscribe. We're very happy to get comments. We try to respond to all of them.